Take your Bible, if you would, up there on the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> and um, I want to do some things as we get started tonight, as I want to explain these verses. They are very, very, very important to us who are part of the church because they are New Testament commandments. They are given specifically to the church. You can find them mirrored in the Old Testament, but they are given specifically to the church, and especially the church of the last days. There are things that we need to know before we approach the days that we're heading into. Um, I also told you earlier in the week that tonight I would give a little bit of my testimony and about why, I mean, why did God bring me here? Why is God using me in, in this particular area? Because 10 years ago, everything that I'm going to show you tonight, 10 years ago, I was on the other side of this issue on, on practically all of these. Um, in 1996, I was associate pastor at our church there, Bethel Free Will Baptist in Festus. Now, it's my home church, and I just, I love the place, and I, I grew up there and have a lot of fondness for the place and for the people. And, um, but at that time, I, I, I was in the ministry, but I was not attentive to listening to the Lord. I, I I guess God was trying to talk to me, and eventually He did, but it took hard, hard things for God to really get my attention. Probably some of you have been there. Can I hear you say amen? amen. But I was in the ministry, and had just, in uh, November of 1996, I had just taken over as pastor of Bethel Church under some very weird, unusual circumstances, and I won't talk about that tonight. But at that point, the moment I walked in that pastor's office, God slammed me. He took me and put me over his knee, and he began to apply the rod of chastening to his son, Mike Hoggard. Uh, I believe in that, don't you? I think that's good for us. God chose, God chose in spite of my life, in spite of my disobedience, in spite of my rebellion, God chose to still give me grace. That's a good God. I think I'm going to hang with Him for a while. Amen. And uh, so God began to get my attention, but there was work that had to be done at Mike Hoggard. And uh, at that time, and I've, I've made no bones about this, at that time, I could have preferred any Bible translation that you gave me. I would have used them. In fact, in Sunday school, I did. Um, and then, towards, you know, somewhere around, as, as, as I took over the role of pastorate, I had this impression, because of what I was seeing going on, I felt like that I needed to perform. I felt like that I needed to Really, I, I treated it like, uh, like somebody in a, in, a, in a business or something like that, or someone who has taken on employment somewhere, and they were trying to show everybody just how well they could do. And I thought that it was my job to increase Sunday school membership, to increase church enrollment, to bring people in. I thought it was my job to do all that stuff. And I had undertaken this mindset that was popular then and is even more so now, that you do whatever it takes, no matter what. And we can no longer use old ways because old ways don't work. We have to use all the new methods and the new ways. So much so, and I was reading books at that time about how to appeal as a church to lost people. Only you can't call them lost people. You have to call them pre-churched people or unchurched people. You have to use all these little words and sayings because they don't understand them all. And all these other things that you have to do to try to lure people into your church. So much so that in May of 1997, I had scheduled, and this guy was a friend of mine, I had scheduled him and his heavy metal Christian rock band to play for our youth group in our church sanctuary in May of 1997. My piano player at our church a year ago, she said, you'll never guess what I found in an old Bible that I had. I said, what? She said, a church bulletin from May of 1997, 
and it said, Rock and Roll for Your Soul. Come to the rock concert in, you know, this Friday at Bethel Church. And I went, oh, my goodness, you know. And I was just so embarrassed. She said, guess where I found it? I said, where? She said, in my NIV Bible <laughs> that I used to carry a long time ago. So thank God that he still lets us. He still lets us. Amen. Amen. And um, I had scheduled that. And the day of the concert. Man, I tell you what, my phone rang. Uh, I had pastors that I hadn't seen in years who were calling me angry. And uh, what are you doing? And on and on. And I had one man that, uh, and I'll never forget his, the tone of his voice nor the spirit in his heart. And he said, Mike, he said, I just wanted to call and tell you. He said, I understand what you're trying to do. And he said, I, I don't necessarily agree with it. He said, but I tell you what I am doing. He said, I didn't call to you out. I called to tell you I was praying for you. And I got off the phone with that man, and God broke my heart. And I got on my face before the Lord, and I said, God, you're going to have to turn this thing off. And God turned it off. I mean, we didn't have the concert. And uh, I lost a friendship over it. But... The thing was that at that point, God began to deal with my heart. I remember uh, right around that same time, we'd had a, uh, had, had a big service uh, at our church. I don't remember what it was. And uh, I walked past, you know how we have those boards that tells us how good we're doing, right? That tells us how the numbers and all that stuff. And I remember walking by that one day in our church lobby, and I saw that it had like um, 129 for worship service and I kid you not I walked past that thing on my way into the sanctuary to go to my office and as soon as I saw it I did in my mind I said I guess I'm doing a pretty good job and I kid you not this is the truth of the Lord when I stepped foot into the sanctuary of that church God stopped me and he I mean he began to deal with me again and he said who do you think you are and instead of going left to my office, I curved right to that old mourner's bench in front of our church. And I got out on my face before the Lord, and I repented in tears. And I said, God, you're right. And God dealt with my heart, and he said, Mike, I'll be in charge of who comes to your church. I'll bring them in, or I'll send them out. It's my church, and I'll do it. You just do what I tell you to do. And I'll worry about who comes and goes into your church. And you know what? God didn't so much chastise me as he did free me. I am no longer under the bondage of thinking that I have to perform every Sunday and put on a show to appeal either to saved people or less saved people can be as fickle as lost people here anymore. I no longer feel that I have to perform or I have to put on some show, or I, I, I'm standing here before you tonight, I don't feel all that well. And a lot of times if I'm in my church and I'm feeling worse than I am, I'll get up and say, guys, I don't feel well. You need to pray for me. And, I'll just, and I may not preach like I normally do, but you know what? It's up to God to take what I said and use it in people's lives. It's not up to me. That's something that I had to learn, and God, by His grace taught me those things. So when I show you what I'm going to show you tonight, understand that I've been on the other side of this, and I know why they're doing what they're doing. And part of it is money. I'll be honest with you. The love of money is what? The root of all evil. And at the bottom of all these efforts that these new pastors are doing in the new churches, it's about money. Because if you're the pastor and you take the church, you come in and you take the church and it's running 50 and you put in all these new programs and, and you have to run 25 people out, but you bring 400 people in in the next four years, you're getting a raise. You're getting a nice raise. You're going to get a car out of this, right? And these guys know this. And if they tell you that's not their motivation... I would say in some cases they're lying, maybe not all. 
but in some cases they're not being honest. Now, I'm not saying this for every pastor. I'm just telling you I know what I went through and I know what I thought. And I know there's other pastors out there who thought, who are thinking now just like I used to think. And I will say this also. I do honestly believe from the bottom of my heart that there are men standing behind pulpits today who are not even born again. Who are not even born again. They have not a new nature in them. They love not the Lord and they don't love that book. If they loved that book, they would hold to it, and there would be something different in that church. But it's obvious to me that we're not just dealing with... And I know, and, and, and I'm sending this video out to as many pastors as I, can, as I can get a hold of. And maybe some of them are thinking about trying some of these methods, or maybe have implemented some of them in their church. And I want you to know, and I want everybody to know, that I'm not just going to harp on this stuff just because I'm trying to protect the old ways. That's not what it's about. I'm not taking a stand to keep pews in the sanctuary. I don't care if you sit on pews, mats, fluffy chairs. I don't care. But it's what is being preached, what is being sung, and what is being done in the house of God. That's where I'm going to focus tonight. And maybe so there's some pastors who are getting caught up in this thing because all their buddies are doing it. And I want to say, maybe you ought to step back and pray. Okay? If you don't believe what I say tonight, if you don't believe where I'm coming from, then you go to God and you ask Him. And He'll be right, won't He? Amen? He'll be right 100% of the time. And so you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Are, are you there? Say amen. amen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Remember from the teaching on the Da Vinci Code, there is, a, there is an idea in the Scripture that is an absolute. God always separates things that are opposite of each other. You follow me so far? Light and... Dark. Give me some opposites out of the Bible. Light and... Dark. Darkness. Good and... Um, God and... Devil. Heaven... There's no intermediary, is there? So we know for a fact that, um, what was it, limbo or uh, purgatory? Stupid, isn't it? It's like the intermediary between heaven and hell. And God said there is no such thing as either heaven or hell. In the, in the, in the garden, there was a tree of life, and a tree of knowledge of good and evil wasn't there. And Adam was supposed to go to one, stay away from the other. You see how it works? So here this same principle is here. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement, here it is, here it is. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? In other words, he says, here's a lost man here, and here's a saved man, and they're to be separate. He said, over here is, is the devil, and here's Christ. They never came to an agreement, did they? Didn't happen. He said, now over here is the temple of idols, pagan worship. And he said, the temple of God is to be over here. And there's nothing, nothing that they should ever agree on. What part hath the temple of God with the temple of idols. And so what I'm going to show you tonight is another conspiracy. I am just loaded with conspiracies. Another conspiracy, a diabolical one. One that comes right out of the Bible, one that comes out of Satan's own heart. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. He means to rule over the church. So the devil has to transform the temple of God into the temple of idols. You follow that? So whatever's going on here in the church has to be transformed in order for the whole transformation to take place. And it's all about, remember what I taught you the other night about principalities. It's all about who's going to be in charge. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather go to a church where the Bible and the Holy Spirit of God is in charge. Amen? But that's not where these guys are going. Okay? Now, 
Uh, on some of my other videos, I've talked about this principle here. Yeah, I call it the Hegelian dialect, but actually the devil loves to use this one because it has, it has to do with what we just read here. This absolute that God said. In fact, God said, if you're in Babylon, what are you supposed to do if you're a Christian? Come out of Babylon and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Don't have any part to do with them. Because Babylon is going to burn, isn't it? And God said, you come out of Babylon and be not partakers of her sins so that you are not partakers of her plagues. If Lot had stayed in Sodom, he'd have fried. So he had to come out of Sodom. You see how it works? Biblical illustration after illustration where God says separate, separate, separate. Get away from them. Get away from them. That's the purpose of the wall that the watchman stands on. The wall is to separate those who are in the world from those who are in the church. Amen? Amen. So, okay. So we have this principle here. We have thesis, which is one idea. We have antithesis, which is its exact opposite. We have light. We have darkness. The devil loves to take these two principles and fuse them together into a new synthesis or synthetic thing. You know what synthetics are, right? It's a mixture of two fabrics opposite of each other, okay? God, God said that it's an abomination for a man to wear the apparel of a woman, didn't he? And vice versa. You see, that's how serious he is about this. He says, keep them separate. I believe a, I believe a man ought to look like a man. And I believe a woman ought to look like a woman. Amen? Amen? But what do we see going around in our world today? We see a synthetic human being with a mixture of both male and female. And God said it's not right. Well, that's preaching that's been lost a long time ago, hasn't it? You don't hear sermons like that. Nobody wants to hear it. Too bad. It's the Word of God. Amen? It's the Word of God. So we have synthesis now. A, a new, two contradicting ideas kind of fused together. So what I'm going to show you tonight is the new synthetic church. It's a mixture of what God said, but then it's a mixture of the world. And God says, I'll not have anything to do with it. It's not right. And so he rejects that church. Okay? And I'm going to deal with some things before your eyes. One of, the, one of the things that really started to catch my attention was how this new church marketed itself. Marketing. Does anybody in here have anything to do with marketing? Does anybody run a business and you advertise? You have to advertise, don't you? You have to let people know. I mean, if you're going to sell something, you've got to let people... If you're going to have a sale, you've got to let people know about it. There's really nothing in, that in itself wrong with it, but it is, it, there are things that you can't do. For instance, you, you say you advertise, okay? Do you know what bait and switch is? A lot of companies, a lot of companies will use what's called bait and switch. They'll, they'll put an ad in the paper telling you that this particular product here, boy, it's, it's on sale for practically nothing. Just show up. Well, you get there and they say, boy, sorry, but we, we just sold the last one to the guy that walked past you on the way out. But here, here's what we got here. See, it's wrong, isn't it? There's actually a law against bait and switch tactics in advertising and business. Okay? But the church now, in fact... You take guys like Rick Warren, some of these names you might be familiar with, some of them you might not be, but these are the guys who are leading the pack of the new synthetic church. Guys like Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, uh, Joel Osteen, Ted Haggard, and others. These guys, they didn't go to the scripture to find out how God wanted to build their church. They began to read marketing manuals. They began to read books written by New Age business leaders to tell them. And so they developed marketing strategies based upon what they were being told. And I'm going to show you some examples of how the new church markets itself today. But first I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. They're up on the screen. 
This caught my attention because I was at camp one day with a fellow pastor, and uh, I, I did not know much about Rick Warren and the purpose-driven church thing. I knew a little bit about it, and I knew that I was uneasy about it. And I'm just not much for programs anyway. So here this pastor friend of mine uh, comes in toting this purpose-driven church book. Now, he has just taken a church up in Kansas City, and he was under the same pressure on himself that I was at the time I took Bethel, I, and I could sense that in him. So he comes in reading this thing, and, and uh, he's, you know, he's kind of reading it a little bit, and then he wants to discuss it with me, and I'm going, man, don't bring this up. But he says, uh, what, have you read this, Mike? And I said, no, I, I haven't really read it. He said, uh, well, he said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, I, I don't know. I said, I don't, I don't know what to think about it. I, I said, I just know that it, it's probably not for us in our church. Well, then he decides to go after me a little. Well, what's not about? What's, what is it about it that's not for your church? He said, we got to bring people in. We got to get people in the doors. We got to fill our churches. We got And I heard everything that I'd heard in myself about ten years ago. And I just, and he, I mean, he unloaded on me in a friendly way. And I'm sitting there, and when, when I got up and left, I walked off, and I said, Lord, I don't know. Should I, should I read that book? I mean, should I, should, should I be doing more? Should I try something? And I, and I was just, and I was really quick, but I, I asked God, I said, God, I mean, you're going to have to show me. And I went to a place, and I grabbed my Bible, and I kid you not, I opened it up to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And this is what God said. Wherefore it shall come to pass. Now I like that phrase. It shall, not maybe, shall come to pass. If you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them. That the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. And he will love thee and bless thee. And what? Multiply. Who's going to multiply them? God is. Think about it. Who's in charge of birth? Think about it. When, they, when eight people went on the ark, a year later, how many people walked off the ark? Eight people. Isn't it funny that they didn't multiply? I mean, you had three sons and their three wives. But there were no births there. Why? God said no. Okay? It wasn't until they all came off the ark. I don't believe that there was a calf born on the ark. Because it wasn't until they came off the ark that God said, Be fruitful and multiply. God's in charge of that, isn't he? <laughs> See, and, and, and why? Why is it so important that God is in charge of raising the attendance in the church? That, it's exactly right. That way the glory doesn't go to Him. Because that's not where it belongs. Or it doesn't go to me. Because it doesn't belong here. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. So who's in charge of raising church attendance? God is. And God alone. That takes the pressure off, doesn't it? Whew. Okay? But now these guys think that it's their job. And they think that because Rick Warren told them so. Rick Warren said, it's your job, Pastor, to bring these guys in. So Rick Warren said this. It's a myth that all you need is prayer and dedication to grow a healthy church. He said that's not true. He said some of the most dedicated prayer warriors I know are pastors of dying churches. It really bothers me that some pastors' conferences promote that myth. You know, the myth he's talking about, right, is prayer. He says it's a myth. Leaving pastors feeling discouraged and guilty instead of encouraged. We've all heard speakers claim, if you'll just pray more, preach the word and be dedicated, then your church will grow. Well, that's just not true. 
I can show you thousands of churches where pastors are doctrinally sound, they love the Lord, they're committed and spirit-filled, and yet their churches are dying on the vine. That's Rick Warren. That's his philosophy. So God says, obey my statutes and keep them and call upon me, and I'll multiply you. Rick Warren said, no, 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 we can't believe that. That's not what it takes. It's a myth. You see where we're going tonight? Amen? Amen. James said, You lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot attain. You fight and war, yet you have not. Why? You ask not. He didn't say you have not because you didn't do a good job or you didn't go out and shake the leaves enough or you didn't go out and do this. That's not what James said. James said you don't have people because you didn't ask for them. I believe prayer can build a Sunday school. I believe prayer can build a church. And so what if you ain't got 10,000 people come to your church? If, you, if you're on your knees praying, Pastor, I guarantee you your church is going to be solid as a rock. They're growing in here. Amen? They're growing in here. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give freely give us all things? See, I, you're looking at a guy. You know my testimony. I believe God answers prayers. I believe he gives us because we ask. Take a look at these brochures that the new churches give out in the mail. They want people to they want people to know that they're not the old church anymore. That they're the new church. Now follow with me, okay? You have the church on this side and you have a lost man on this side. Lost man says I'm not coming to your church because I don't want to wear a suit or I don't want to dress up. So the new synthetic church says, you don't have to dress up to come to our church. We'll make you feel comfortable as you are. Well, the lost man says, okay, I'm not going to come to your church because I don't want to sing Rock of Ages cleft for me. New synthetic church says, we threw that song out a long time ago. So if you come to our church, you won't hear those old hymns. We're playing music that you listened to yesterday on the way to work. And I'll prove it to you. Lost man says, I don't want to come to your church because it's boring. The new synthetic church says, we've added light shows and dancing girls and video programs and things for the kids. We are an entertainment center. Lost man says, I don't want to come to church because I don't want to be preached at. Listen, New Synthetic Church says, we're not going to preach at you. You won't hear us say anything about the blood or sin or your wicked lifestyle or your beer guzzling. We won't say anything about it. In fact, you'd be surprised at what we're willing to talk about to get you into our new church. And I'm telling you the truth, and I'm going to show you the evidence. So they market. They market against churches like this. Because now we're in competition, aren't we? Because, you know what? This church over here wants to grow. Well, they may not be able to get 150 lost people in, but I bet they can get 200 church people that want to change churches. And there's just enough people in churches right now who are still preaching the truth that want out of there, that want the new stuff. And these new churches are more than glad to oblige them. So they market against the traditional church, church casual. God rocks. See the old man, even the old man's up there having fun, isn't he? Because he's listening to rock and roll. I could just see some of you guys doing that. <laughs> Life's too short for long-faced religion. Come to our church. We make it better. It's too boring. I don't have time. This lady here, I'm going to show you what's printed on the card. She said, when I walked out of my parents' church, I never thought I'd walk back in. For me, church was all about rules, uncomfortable clothes, and trying to stay awake. Let me ask you a question, those of you who go to church here. Is that what this church is all about? Now, see, there's, there's some life here. There's some blood here, isn't there? There's a spirit here. I don't see, I don't see one of the deacons standing the back of the church with a whip waking you up every five minutes. Well, maybe, of course, maybe not, not, not a bad idea, but... But see, they're marketing against traditional churches. 
She said it was watching my parents act like saints on Sunday and sinners the other six days. Well, maybe her parents weren't going to the right church back then. If that was church, you could have it. I had moved on in my life, and I didn't need church. That's why it was so strange that as an adult, I find myself really wanting a spiritual facet to my life. That's what's being marketed. They're marketing against the old church. Here's a marketing technique. You use vulgarity. Look at that. See, they, they think it's coy. That Hey, we're the church that cusses now. Right? If you come to our church, we'll say stuff like that. I let my teenagers go to a youth conference. A Free Will Baptist youth conference. And the big dog youth preacher that they got up there after the rock and roll show cussed at those kids and justified it. And I went back and told me, and I said, we're not going again. We haven't been back. That's wrong. Amen? Amen. How about this one? The new synthetic church. See, the marketing on, based upon TV shows, what's current? Desperate house, Housewives. Desperate Housewives. Now, I, I, want you to, I want you to think about this for a minute. I've never seen this show, but I, 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 I can guess what it's about. About a bunch of wives sleep around on their old men when their men, husbands go off to work. And so we're going we're gonna to use the same logo, the same theme, a lot of the same words. We're going to twist it around a little bit. By the way, this is a mailer that you mail out to people because you're going to preach a series of messages based on this theme that you as pastor downloaded off the internet. And thousands of churches across the country preach this exact same series of messages. Now stop and think about this. Who wrote the sermons? <laughs> well, probably at the core of it, the devil was. But I thought that the man of God was responsible for getting in the book to deliver to his people what God wanted them to hear. But they, see, that's changed now, and I'm going to show you more of that. Here's another one. American idols trying to grasp everybody's attention with worldliness. Here's one. Life swap. Are you getting mad yet? Check this one out. See, you send that to an old guy in the mail. Or you hang it on his door. If you'll come to church. Now, anybody that knows anything about marketing, they know that sex sells. This is going to get worse tonight. But they know that sex sells. So the church, the church, the holy tabernacle of God sent you a picture showing two people in, with an innuendo of two people in bed. And they said, come to church, we've got more. One church even took this, put it on a billboard. And if you go to that website, see, the church wants you to go to that website, mylamesexlife.com, and it'll talk a little bit about what they were doing and then redirect you to the church website and give you their service times. Okay? Are you glad you came tonight? You see why, you see why this is so important? You see why we need to get this out? Okay? We need to get this out. By the way, that reminds me, that Hooters there reminds me, back before I even started researching this, I, re I remember reading an article about a pastor, probably of one of these churches, that had started a Hooters Bible study. He was going to Hooters twice a week, ordering chicken wings, and holding a quote-unquote Bible study for people, and justifying it. i tell you something, that's a man that's not been with God. That's exactly right. How could he justify it? Listen, that pastor's sitting there watching those Hooter gals in their scantily clothing. 
and and never mind. It's not right. And there's still some people in the church that ought to have sense to know that this ain't right. How about this one? Girls of the Bible gone crazy. What are we selling here? What are we marketing? What are we luring them in with? Hmm. Babylon is trying to take over the church, isn't she? Mystery Babylon the Great is trying to take over the church, isn't she? And what is Mystery Babylon the mother of? Harlots. That's exactly right. Okay? See, it's coming right out of the Bible, isn't it? God saw this a long time ago. Here's Jesus, the homeboy. What's up? Does anybody remember where that phrase came from? Wasn't a TV show? Beer commercials. Remember the beer commercials? Budweiser beer commercials. Yeah, and another marketing method is association. So what are they associating our Savior with? Something that all these people would remember from a Budweiser ad. Okay. Here's a church, a hippie church called The Way. They, they, they advertise a trip through the teachings of the original hippie from Nazareth. A new series of far-out Sunday experiences brought to you by the Cool Cats at the Meeting House, a church for people who aren't into church. By the way, bring this groovy card with you and get a free cup of the brown mind-altering substance. Yeah. The love shack. Baby, that's where it's at. See, see, marketers know that if you can associate their product with one of several things, it'll sell. One of them was sex. The other is popularity. Don't go to Ozark Hills Church. Nobody goes there. Come to the cool church. That's where it's all happening at. And it works. Advertisers will tell you this works. And so Bill Hybels and Rick Warren and these other guys say, if it works, then it's okay. It's called pragmatism. If it works, it's okay. The ends justify the means. However we decide to do it, if we get the achieved result or the desired result, which is people sitting in the church then it's okay, and God will pat us on the back and say, well done. They're fooling themselves. Take your kids to church. Maybe God will understand them. This church marketed a Sunday evening called Sunday Night Football. Whether you're a diehard fan or just need some quality guy time, come, bring a snack, and join us as we cheer on our favorite teams on the big screen. Okay? The church is Element Life Church. How about this one? Our fall worship schedule allows time for your other religion. In other words, they've catered the morning worship service so you can go to church and be back in time for the first kickoff. Okay? Oh, wait a minute. I thought it was the Lord's Day. Right? The naked church. I thought this one was good. It's a church, it's a pastor's conference on church growth, and they call it the Naked Church. It seems I read somewhere, yes, in the book of Revelation chapter 3, where God called the Laodicean church naked. Boy, they got it right, didn't they? Something wrong with them. Uh, this is a woman's conference. It's there on the left, Voice to the Nations, a cherished conference, uh, a church putting on a woman's conference at the church. But notice the marketing style is similar to the gals on Sex and the City. Okay? This is the new womanhood emerging in the church. Whereas the Bible says, the Bible says that a woman is to be chaste. A woman is to be, have a quiet spirit. Amen? But remember who she is that's trying to take over the church. A mother of harlots. That's who's trying to take over, so you associate it with them. 
How about this, church advertising, they're going to have porn Sunday. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wicked. And this is one of those pre-designed church sermon series that you can buy and preach this in your church and then have the marketing materials to go with it. it all, remember what I said about spiritual wickedness in high places. All this stuff, this is not a grassroots thing of building the church. All this is coming down from the big publishing houses who are making lots of money off of this. And who's in charge of these? One church called The Ridge Community Church sent out multiple mailings of postcards. They sent them all over the place. One listed the top ten reasons why people don't go to church. Among them were two words, boring. Seven letters, Packers. One was, when I want to feel really guilty, I just call my mom. Or, I don't listen to music from the 1800s, why should I sing it? They say, those are the reasons why you don't go to church. Flip the card around, and they say, we don't do any of that stuff, so you can come to our church. This same church calls itself a church for people who don't like going to church. And they meet in a movie theater, and in their inaugural service, passed out communion wafers from a popcorn bucket. That is blasphemy. It's sick, and it's blasphemy. But it's all about who, the edge. Who's got the edge now? And I guarantee you there's some other churches when they found out about that, they thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's do that. A man by the name of Gary Gilley reviewed George Barna. George Barna wrote a lot of these books where he did a lot of the statistics. Pastors are, are preaching based upon statistics. It's like politicians who feel the wind of, of which way the country is going and they, and they lead according to what everybody wants instead of having a politician who stands on principles and says, this is how I'm voting. The politician will go, oh, I think the country wants this. And so he'll do that and he does that to get reelected, right? And so George Barna and these other guys, they wrote out all these statistics about what it would take to get people in church. The pastors all read the books. I read the books. Saw the statistics and thought, man, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. George Barna wrote all this stuff and the pastor said, man, we've got to do all this stuff. This is how the lost people are. Man, why? Why, why didn't they just read this one? See, the Bible says there's simplicity in Christ. Even for the pastor, it's supposed to be simple because we're not very smart. God should, should have and did make it easy for us pastors to figure out without going to all the conferences and spending all the money how we could win a lost person to Jesus Christ. But George Barner wrote all these books and one guy, this guy reviewed one of his books which predicts radical changes in American evangel evangelicalism in the next 20 years. The review says, quote, The local church is now flush with drama, entertainment, social events, psychology, and programs galore, but gone is the power and glory of God. And to that I hear, it's exactly right. Now I'm going to deal with four aspects of how they're taking the 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 holy, sacred, spirit-filled church of God. We're, talking, we're not talking about new arts upstart churches. We're talking about churches that stood for something 30 years ago. And they had a pastor that believed the word of God and he preached it. And then they got a new pastor in that said, we need to do something with this church. And I'll say this, and any pastor that watches this knows that I'm telling the truth, because it happens just about every place where they're going to bring in and implement all these new programs, including Purpose Driven, that those who sit in that church don't care how long you've been there. If you don't like it, there's the door, and they'll tell you that. They will put you out on the street 
because what they can't have is you going to the other church members saying, this is not right, guys. This is not right. So what, and, and, I, and I kid you not, it's taught at the pastor's conferences when they're training them how to transfer their church from what they call a traditional church to the new synthetic church, they actually train those pastors on ways of getting rid of those people. Because you can't be there if you're going to go against the system. So, they invade the Word of God, prayer, the worship service, and preaching. Four elements of what, of what makes a church, and I'm going to show you how they've synthesized it, or synthesized it, turned it over from the temple of God into the temple of idols. Let's deal with the Word of God. Now, I have a video back here. I'm not going to rehash a lot of the things that I've already talked about on the Bible translation issue. And I'll say this for the sake of you and for anybody that watches this video, I'll say this. You may not necessarily agree with my stand on the King James Bible. I love that old book and I'll die for it because it saved my life. Okay? I just like what it says. It speaks to my heart. It's right. I've never seen it wrong one time. But I'll say this. There's pastors out there, probably some good guys that were... I mean, I, I got into this NIV thing for a while. They say, well, you know, I, I like the revised standard or this and that. It's most, you know, I've heard all this stuff. But I'll say, you know what? It, they, all, what, what they were trying to do... You see, there's, there's a conspiracy going on here, right? The ends of leading people away or leading the church away from the Word of God, the end of the road was not the NIV. The end of the road was not the Revised Standard Version. It's for the Bibles that are out this year and the ones that are coming out in the next five years. That's where they're really going with it. And so, here you had, watch this. See, the devil uses gradualism, doesn't he? How many of you experienced in your life how, the devil, how you woke up backslid one day and said, how did I get here? The devil said, one step at a time. So for years, for hundreds of years, all the churches heard the authorized Bible. Somewhere down the road, some of the liberal churches took a step and began using the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which really most mainstream good churches don't never, never use to begin with. But then they come out with the NIV. And while you had some pastors who were comparing the King James with the NIV, and they said, man, I don't like that NIV. Man, I, that, that, there's something, something not right about that. When they came out with the new King James, they said, well, we'll try that one. It's a step. So, and, and automatically, automatically in their church, you had people who still had the King James. Every now and then, pastor would read something, and it wasn't quite the same. So you know what happened over the course of 20 years? People, Brother Lonnie told me this. He said to Mike, when Brother Leo went to that new church, he said there wasn't... There wasn't 25 people out of 100 that had a Bible in their hand. So people stopped bringing their Bible to church. You think I'm kidding you. And then they go to the pastor's conferences, and the pastors are all using the NIV, so they said, well, it ain't that bad. Step. Rick Warren comes out with Purpose Driven Life. And in this book, he ransacked the modern translations. He used all of them that he could find. What, in fact, whatever proved his point is the translation that he used. That's pretty good, isn't it? If you don't like it, if you don't say it right in this one, then you go to this one. It'll be... Okay? So then they take another step. And the Bible publishers are right on top of this, aren't they? In fact, they're the ones leading you away. Zondervan's the chief of them. Zondervan is owned by Harper Collins 
Publishing, who is the sole publisher of the Satanic Bible written by Anton LaVey. HarperCollins Publishing is owned by News Corp, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, one of the most powerful media men in all the world. So watch this. Rupert Murdoch owns Fox News Channel, Fox Broadcasting. Rupert Murdoch owns Zondervan Publishing. Zondervan Publishing publishes two books, The Purpose Driven Life and The Purpose Driven Church, and all the calendars, all of the knickknacks, all of the notepads, all of the cards, they publish all of that, and they're getting a lot of money out of this, aren't they? Okay? So when the book sales go, watch this. I figured this out. When the book sales start going down a little bit, or people start forgetting about these books and all that stuff goes with it, guess what they did? They took Rick Warren and had him interviewed for a whole hour on Fox News Channel. And guess what happens the next day? Everybody's going out buying purpose-driven life books, purpose-driven. It's just pretty slick, isn't it? The love of money. It's the root of all evil. So here's a Bible that Zondervan publishes called True Images Bible. The Bible for teen girls. Okay, Looks cute, doesn't it, ladies? Little necklace on the front, you know. and that, Boy, it's designed just for you. And it's got the new international version of it. And the reason why is Zondervan owns the copyrights to that version. So they can make money that way. But then you open the Bible up. And in the, in the Bible, they have all these little articles written for girls about your age. This one called In Focus said, Emma had, and I took the word out, fornication with a guy friend of ours last week, just for fun. They're not dating, although they've always flirted with each other a lot. And Emma claims that it is not even real sex. I won't even tell you the words that were there in place of what I put fornication in. In a Bible for 12-year-old girls. All my friends are wondering if this guy or that guy likes them. I don't even like any guys right now. Instead, I wonder if I have a crush on Sierra. She's one of my best friends. <laughs> the girls are going... <laughs> <laughs> so ought the church. These articles recommend dating habits such as going to starlight outdoor concerts since they will provide, quote, romantic tunes and cuddling opportunities. We're talking about teenagers. They really shouldn't be doing that. Is that old-fashioned or is that just right? Advises young girls that, listen to this, listen to this, and remember, mother of harlots. Advises young girls that you've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince. You know what that's telling those kids, those girls to do? All oh, just hop around, date around, jump from guy to guy to guy to guy. They're raising harlot girls. Let's talk about this Bible called The Message. Anybody ever heard of this Bible? Guess what? It's endorsed by Chuck Swindoll, Billy Graham, Bill Hybels, Jack Hayford, Max Lucado, Rick Warren. You know all those books you buy at the Christian bookstore. These guys endorsed that Bible. It's sold over 10 million copies and is ranked as one of the top five selling Bibles right now. Okay, it's called The Message. Now remember, the NIV was not where they were going to stop. They weren't going to stop until they had taken the Word of God, the pure Word of God, and turned it over to guess whose words. Okay? Okay. Well, it looks like to me they're on the right track. So you open up the message, and in the King James, the word Lord appears 711 times in the New Testament, but it only appears 23 times in the message, and it never directly uses this word in relationship to Jesus. It never calls Jesus Lord Jesus. You're used to reading that in your Bible, aren't you? Lord Jesus, Lord... It never says that in the message. Here's what they replaced it with. Master Jesus, take my life. The one who raised up 
Master Jesus, the grace of Master Jesus be with all of you. Yes, come, Master Jesus. That word master, it's a New Age term. The New Age movement teaches the appearing of what's called ascended masters. And the New Age movement teaches that Jesus was one of these masters. So this message Bible has already New Age overtones to it by calling Jesus Master Jesus. They're giving him the title that the New Age gives to Jesus who have come and will come and bring the world to a new age, or newage, because it rhymes with sewage, of enlightenment. Jesus, here, here's what the new agers say. Jesus to the new age is a man ascended to be a master. A basic tenet of the new age thinking is that of the master Jesus. Here's another one. Master God. Who am I, my master God? Master God, only you know that. The masters according to New Age writers, are the custodians of the divine plan for this planet. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, this is the way that the message renders this verse. When the high God gave the nations their stake, gave them their place on earth, he put each of the peoples with the boundaries under the care of the divine guardians. Do you know what it says in the King James? Children of Israel. But they've called them the divine guardians. That is another New Age term. Since the one who said, these are quotes from the message. They call Jesus the one, the one, the one. The one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin. No one has ever seen the Father except the one. Did you think I was the one? And that phrase, the one, according to the New Age movement, the Christ self then has communication with the Father who in both principle and person is the presence of God, the I am that I am, or the I am presence. This inevitably brings in the concept of the presence, the presence. That's another New Age term. And so in the message, I, I abbreviated the message up there on the screen. Yeah. According to the mess, their rendering says, I saw a great white throne and the one... By the way, the one is a new age term for the Antichrist. The one who is going to rise up. Has anybody seen the Matrix movie? What was Neo? He was the one. That whole series was a, the Warshawski brothers ransacked human religion to put it in those three movies, and Neo was intended to be. See, he died and was born again, and he is the one, the savior of earth. The Antichrist. Nothing could stand before or against the presence. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence. That's what they're calling God. Notice what they talk about power that a Christian had. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. This is a quote from the Message Bible. The energies of prayer. That energy is God's energy, and energy deep within you. All this energy issues from Christ. It sounds like one of those weird guys from California going, Ooh, I love your energy, dude. <laughs> new Age philosophy. This is a New Age Bible. And I saw little kids at camp carrying this one around. And their pastor, who has no discernment, Oh, it's okay. You can understand it, right? The King James Bible in Isaiah 14, 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? See, they got it right. That's his name, isn't it? King James is the only Bible that you'll find that in. All the others, the new translations, they changed it. NIV calls him uh, Morning Star. But the morning star is Jesus. It's pretty slick, isn't it? Because the devil wants every... By the way, remember, Jesus is the roaring lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So when the Bible says, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, the devil is trying to masquerade as who? Jesus. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So when the NIV replaces Lucifer with Morning Star, Lucifer, his name literally means light bearer. 
Elise Bailey, a witch and an occultist, 100 years ago said, the one in whom the light shines becomes a light bearer in a dark world, literally a Lucifer. She said, these words carry meaning to all true disciples and present them with an analogous goal, which they define to themselves as that of finding light, appropriating the light, and themselves become light bearers or lucifers. In other words, she's, those who are trained in the New Age and those who are initiated into these new practices, they become lucifers, light bearers. The Message Bible quotes Matthew 5.15, If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? Psalm 97, 11, light seeds are planted in the souls of God's people. This is New Age teaching to the core. And Rick Warren used the message in his books, Purpose Driven Life and Purpose Driven Church. See, that tells you right there, there's something there. It's going to steer the ship the wrong way. Let's move on. Prayer. What is prayer? What is prayer? Communication between you and God. Okay? You pray? Okay? You pray with your mouth sometimes? Out loud? Yeah. Yeah. For with the heart man believeth in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, I'm not against mind praying. Amen? I mean, certainly while you're driving your car, you know, you, you ought to pray. In your, in your heart, in your spirit. When I was being electrocuted under that house, my mouth couldn't move. I prayed in my spirit, and God heard that. And so I believed that. But prayer, but in, fact, in fact, let's go to the Scripture. Let the Scripture define what prayer is. Prayer is asking. First Timothy, I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications. What is supplication? Look at the word. It has S-U-P-P-L. What is a supply? How many of you need supplies? Amen? More fish. We just had a fish fry tonight, so we need more fish. That's supplies. Amen? And where are we supposed to get our supplies from? God is supposed... God who will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. That's what a supplication is. It's asking God to meet your needs, isn't it? And so notice how the Bible supplications with the word prayer so you can identify what prayer is. Supplications and prayers and intercessions. First Timothy 5. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in what? Supplications and prayers. The two are together to show you the connection. Hebrews 5, 7. Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and what? Supplications. Prayer is asking, isn't it? Talking to God. Now we have new synthetic prayer, which is coming into the church. This is a quote from the Purpose Driven Church. He said many Christians use breath prayers throughout their day. You choose a brief sentence or a simple phrase that can be repeated to Jesus in one breath. You are with me. I receive your grace. I'm depending on you. I want to know you. I belong to you. You do that over and over and over and over and over again. And Rick Warren said, give it a try. The purpose, it's called contemplative prayer. The purpose of contemplative prayer is to enter an altered state of consciousness. Now remember we talked about hypnosis the other night. You remember that? Hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness. It is a form of drunkenness. The Bible says be what? Sober. When you're hypnotized, the filters in the firewalls go down. Suggestion takes place. Altered state of consciousness are forms of drunkenness. And so the purpose of contemplative prayer is to enter an altered state of consciousness in order to find one's true self, thus finding God. Do you get that? When you find yourself, you'll find God. See, that's a pagan 
doctrine that God is in us all, right? Thus finding God. The, this true self relates to the belief that man is basically good. Proponents of contemplative prayer teach that all human beings have a divine center and that all, not just born-again believers, should practice contemplative prayer. Here is a company that is owned by Zonerfin Publishing. They're called YouthSpecialties.com. They specialize in materials and conferences for youth pastors. The, one of the founders of YouthSpecialties.com wrote an article about contemplative prayer. This is what he said. He was talking to a lady, and he was talking about meditation. And she said, you're going to teach us to meditate, she asked. That's right, I said. Isn't that New Age or Buddhist, she asked. Well, Buddhists do meditate, and there are many in New Age meditative practices, but what I'm going to teach you is Christian meditation. I silently promised myself to never use the word meditation in public Christian setting ever again. So right there, he's saying, I'm going to mislead people from now on. I'm going to use a different word. She said, what's the difference? He said, well, on the surface, nothing. The approach to meditation for a Buddhist looks an awful like what I do. The difference is the reason we're doing it. The Buddhist empties the mind for the sake of emptying it. The Christian empties the mind to fill it with Christ. Now, I want to stop right here and I want to tell you something. Never at one time does the Bible tell you to empty your mind. And if you're ever in a religious service and some guy tells you, listen to me, young people, if some guy tells you to empty your mind, if you're at school and your teacher tells you to lay on the floor and empty your mind, you run home and tell your mom and daddy. Because they are trying to introduce to you new age techniques of opening up your soul to, to the devil. Does the Bible say anything about meditate? Yes. Paul gives us eight things and he said, think on these things. Whatsoever is pure, pure whatsoever is true, whatsoever is lovely. What's it? And when the Bible tells us to meditate, it doesn't tell us to empty our mind. It tells us to meditate on what? The Word of God. That means get that thing, get out. That means, number one, read the book. Amen? You know why this stuff's taking over the church? Because people forgot to read the Bible anymore. So you got I'm giving you homework assignment. When you walk out of here, now go home and read that book. Amen? That's homework. And don't show up Sunday until you have. Well, I just, I just fixed you, Brother John. If the attendance is down Sunday morning, you know why. Go home and read that book. Read that book, read that book, and then meditate on that book. Think about what those things. David said, Thy word have I what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. He meditated on the word of God. He didn't empty his mind out. But that's what they're espousing. He, he says, in describing his meditative prayer time, he says, I was largely alone in my explorations. I, I tired of debates with classmates who accused the disciplines of being occult practices, so I started using the phrase listening prayer. He says, if I change the term, then it's okay. When I talked about my own experiences in meditation, I built myself a prayer room. Listen to this. A tiny sanctuary in a basement closet filled with books on spiritual disciplines, contemplative prayer, and Christian mysticism. The occult mixed into Christianity is what it is. In that space, I lit candles, burned incense, hung rosaries, and listened to tapes of Benedictine monks. Now, this is the guy who's training your youth pastors. And the youth pastors are taking this stuff back to the church. Hey, kids, we're going to try something neat this Friday night at the youth meeting. And mom and daddy never find out about it, found out about it. Christian contemplative prayer is the opening of mind and heart, our whole being, to God. The ultimate mystery. Beyond thoughts, words, and emotions, whom we know by faith is within us, closer than breathing, thinking, feeling, and choosing. Even closer than consciousness itself. The root of all prayer is interior silence. Now, we've already seen from the Bible that that's not true. The root of prayer is asking. But it's thanking God. That's very good. But they say that the root of prayer is nothing. Silence. 
Though we think of prayer as thoughts or feelings expressed in words, this is only one expression. Contemplative prayer is a prayer of silence, an experience of God's presence as the ground in which our being is rooted, the source from whom our life emerges at every moment. There's something that I, that I missed out here that I wanted to show you that he actually admitted. Remember I told you that contemplative prayer is an altered state of consciousness? He says, he said, I have reached the point of being able to achieve alpha brain patterns, the state in which dreams occur while still awake and meditating. He is admitting that this brings you to a state of drunkenness. Contemplative prayer can develop our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we commune with God beyond words, thoughts, feelings, and actions. These are websites dedicated to contemplative prayer. Here is Nav Press, and this is a Sunday school literature handout teaching little kids how to do contemplative prayer. And, and basically, if you don't understand what I'm, what I'm talking about, I'm going to sit on the altar. Here we go. Yeah. In the middle. Contemplative prayer is you get alone, you block out everything, you close your eyes. You might have some kind of chant music in the background, or you might chant yourself. And you completely empty your mind of all thoughts all expressions, everything, and you wait until you begin to hear a voice. Or until you go into a trance, like a seance. So Nav Press is teaching kids how to do it. Notice they say that we're going to the next level. And in this article, they actually talk about the 17th century mystic Catholic monk. Remember how I said that the Vatican was trying to take... Boy, it sounds like it, doesn't it? When we think that we have to listen and do what monks did in order to get closer to God, something's wrong. This is for kids. This is for little kids. They're tar you see, they know, they know they're not going to get you. Without being offensive, because you're too old. So they're going after this guy here and this young lady here. And this young lady here. That's who they're going after. They're going after the next generation of church so they can have what they want. From youthspecialties.com, they also talk about deep breathing. You sit down and you, ooh, take in God. Deep breathing. A practice often used in New Age meditation techniques, yoga and hypnosis. They have a thing called Lectio Divina or Logos Meditation. It's called sacred reading, a slow meditating on a portion of scripture. Watch this, without exegesis or analysis. And what that means is you pick a piece of scripture and you meditate on it, but you don't think about what it means. You chant it over and over and over and over again. It's similar to a chant used in yoga. And even yoga now is being marketed to Christians, to churches. The gal that wrote this book, calls herself a minister. And she's going around all of the country ministering to churches to get churches involved in the New Age Eastern mystic practice of yoga. And if you don't know much about what it is, yoga was about getting in touch with the true divine of the universe, the inner self. And there's even more diabolical things associated with it well that I'm not going to talk about in this setting. A thing called Ignatian Contemplation, named after, guess who? Ignatius de Loyola, the father of the Jesuits. The Jesuits, you remember the military branch of the Vatican? The guys who infiltrated nations and kings 
and denominations and religions to bring them back under the power of the Vatican. These are being sold to our kids and to our youth groups. It incorporates the use of the imagination. In other words, you sit down and you imagine God. You imagine things being wonderful. You, ima you get in this little la-la land of imagination. What does God say about our imagination? He said the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The Bible says to cast down imaginations. It said don't use them. Labyrinth prayer walking is another thing they're introducing. Mazes. And you go, to, you go to Europe, you see these old Catholic churches with mazes built into the sanctuary. They're designed for people to walk the labyrinth or the maze. And on this labyrinth, there are 11 stations. And you walk, meditating, and you stop. You, you know what you're talking about. You stop at one of the stations and you meditate on this thing. And then you go and you meditate over here and you walk and you meditate. I have pictures of youth groups doing this. Does Rick Warren promote this? In an issue of Rick Warren's newsletter, Saddleback Pastor Lawrence Witt said, The goal of solitude or contemplative prayer is not so much to unplug from my crazy world as it is to change frequencies. Did you catch that? So that I can hear the Father. See, they've reversed prayer. Prayer, prayer was you talking to God. Does God talk to us? Yes. How? Hang on. Change frequencies is a new age term for the alpha state and altered state of consciousness. Rick Warren says, go for it. Witt admits that this comes by repeating a phrase or a word over and over again. Now see what the Bible says about how we hear from God. Does the Bible say, now sit down, wad your legs up. Boy, I'm, I can't do that, so I'm not even going to try. Empty your mind, chant, and I'll talk to you. Did God say that? Look at what God did say. When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel. How? In their hearing. Hearing from God is from the book. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but what? Of hearing the words of the Lord. See? See? Remember what I said the other night about principalities? Principality says, take the book away. So they took the book away, but you've got to replace it with something else so you can hear from God. So they replaced it with all these New Age practices. They are things, hearing, supposedly hearing from God, without the Word. And I want to tell you something. God doesn't talk outside of that book. He don't talk to nobody outside of that book. Amen? The book and the Holy Ghost of God are the two witnesses that you need to know whether or not God's a-talking. And don't tell me otherwise either. Where, where have we gone? In the Protestant church, for crying out loud. The church that separated from Rome because Rome said, uh, the Holy Father tells us what God says. And we said, no, that's not true. We believe sola scriptura, which means only the Word of God. But now we've abandoned that. See, we stepped, see, remember the NIV wasn't where we were going. We were going completely away from the Bible itself. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. He that, watch this, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, look what God said about his prayer. Even his prayer shall be what? They're committing, they're committing abominations. When they sit with their youth groups and their focus and their worship. Listen to this.
My sweet Lord. Right? Hallelujah. My sweet Lord. Does anybody recognize that song? Who is that, Virginia? George Harrison. George Harrison. By the way, this song's being used in churches. Okay? Do you know who the Lord was that George Harrison worshipped? It actually, you notice in the background they were going, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Listen to the other part of the song. Listen to what they sing in the background. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. George Harrison was a, an occultist following Eastern mysticism. The song's being played in churches as a worship song. So how do you identify? When all they say, listen to this, when all they say in the worship service are songs devoted to you, you're hard pressed in the new songs to find Jesus mentioned. It's you. So how do you know? How do you know? Especially when God said this. But when you pray, use not what? <coughs> Don't do it over and over and over and over again. As the heathen do. God said that chant to the sound of the vile and invent to themselves instruments of music like David that drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore, you know what that is telling you? It said they invent all kinds of instruments and sing all kinds of songs, but they're not grieved over sin. Therefore now they shall go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. He said in Isaiah, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink. Remember, strong drink equals false doctrine. That continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabard and the pipe and the wine are in their feast. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. If it's a church service and they call it worship, and yet the whole service is, has nothing to do with Christ, the blood, and the atonement for sins, it's not church. From YouSpecialties.com. Here we go again. Singing is one of the most essential elements of worship. Short songs repeated again and again. Wait a minute. Jesus just got done saying, don't do that. It's just like little kids. You tell little kids, don't go in there. What are they going to do? They're going in there. We are like children. Jesus said, don't do it. So what are we going to do? He said... Short songs repeated again and again give it a meditative character. He's saying the music is going to lead you into alpha state. Altered forms of consciousness. That's what he said. Using just a few words, they express a basic reality of faith. Skipping on down. Meditative singing thus becomes a way of listening to God. Did you catch that? Let the music lull you into that state so you can then listen to God. That's not Bible, is it? That's not Bible. That's why the music is designed the way it is. Here's what one pastor of a church said. Now someone might ask, is it okay to let unchurched set the agenda for our services? The answer to that fact is yes. Let's see what God said. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Sinned against the Lord their God, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel which they had made. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and did what? They went after the heathen that were around about them. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted what? The house of the Lord. Why? 
by doing it the way lost people do it. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, for ye have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. So we go back to the statement that the reverend made. Is it okay to let the unchurched set the agenda for our churches? He said, yes. God said, not only is it not okay, I'll punish you for it. Amy Grant said, now a lot of this music, I mean all these big contemporary singers... It all follows their lead. So Amy Grant says, what we're trying to do is take Christian principles and make them understandable. Even if it doesn't say Jesus, it doesn't matter. Rich Mullins said, I'm really sick of all this heavy-handed Christianity. Musicians take themselves too seriously. They should have more fun and should stop preaching. The Birmingham News said, if you were not familiar with Michael W. Smith's standing in the world of contemporary Christian music, you might attend one of his concerts and come out none the wiser. In other words, said, if you didn't know he was a Christian singer, when you got there, you wouldn't know it when you left. That's what the news said. Jason Martin of Starflyer 59, a contemporary Christian music group, said a lot of bands, the reason they get so turned off it's because you have to put the word Jesus in every line. That's why so many bands get almost anti-Jesus in their lyrics, even though they're Christians. Michael Card said, The lyrics of a good number of the songs don't reveal anything specifically Christian. Not a lot of the big songs are identifiably Christian. These are the ones being sung in the churches now. John chapter 12, Jesus said, Nevertheless, or the Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief of the rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. What drives the contemporary Christian music industry? God, the scriptures, the Holy Ghost, what? Money. And the money doesn't come if the people don't like the song. So they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Even though they believe in Jesus. That's what it says here. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? For thou savorest not the things that be of God but those that be of men. You know what the word savor is, don't you? It's when you take that T-bone steak and you put them spices on it and you stick that on that grill. Yeah! And you start sucking in them fumes, man. And you go, man, I want that. And then you put it in your mouth and you just suck on it. Mm. Right? right? We've all eaten here. Amen? So, when, yeah. So when you savor something, when you savor the things of men, you drive by that tavern and you hear that music and you go, oh man. That's good. <laughs> you watch that TV show where you get on your computer and you see that image. And you go, that's good. You savor the things of men and not of God. And why did he say it to Peter? He said, get thee behind me. It's a mark of where Satan is. When you savor the things of men and not of God. So they run popularity contests now. Contemporary Christian Magazine has a little contest, a little talent search. It's the It Girl. And they're looking for a young lady that they can promote on, on an album or something like that. And are they looking for the godly young lady who's full of Christian character? who has the recommendation of her parents and her pastor, and who is the admiration of her peers, because she is a godly Christian young lady. No. She has to look good in jeans and a tight shirt. She has to dance well and sing well. Christian. Christian concerts here, up on the screen. Christian concerts. 
By the way, the youth conferences look like this too. The youth conferences. So don't get mad at your pastor when you say, well, pastor, all the other churches are going to the youth conference. How come we can't send our kids? Pastor says, I know what's going on there. And you can take your kid if you want to, but we're not going. Don't get mad at him. He's watching for your souls. But you know what happens? They do get mad at the preacher. And then they go down the road to the new community church. Because their kids are going to the youth conference. So that church running 700 people has gained a family of five. And this church running 70 has lost some people and the pastor's weeping while they walk. The Dallas Morning News concerning a DC talk concert called The Freak Show said as teenagers shrieks filled the Dallas Convention Center one of the relatively few grown-ups in the sold-out crowd observed this is just like the Beatles. Christian. So you remember what went on at Beatles concerts. Remember what the young ladies did. How they threw themselves and their bodies on the stage. I'm not lying, guys. This same stuff goes on at these Christian concerts. His, Michael W. Smith's concerts, draw hundreds of thousands of fans each year, mostly teenage girls who scream out their affection for him non-stop throughout. To his fans, Smith is the absolute greatest there is, bar none. What else do these people sing? Amy Grant sings Big Yellow Taxi by New Age Priestess Johnny Mitchell. DC Talk sings All Apologies by Kurt Bain. They sing these at these concerts. Res Band, they sing Somebody to Love by Jefferson Airplane. Group called Deliverance, they sing After Forever by Black Sabbath. Point of Grace, they sing a song called, they actually recorded this, Sing a Song by Earth, Wind, and Fire. These are occult songs, occult groups, just being part of the world. Christianity Today said, now the industry is celebrity driven. The song is almost irrelevant. The focus is on the person, and songs have become disposable. Keith Green said, why do we idolize Christian singers and speakers? We go from glorifying musicians in the world to glorifying Christian musicians. It's all idolatry. He was right. Now the Ridge Community Church, now watch this. Getting the church away from the hymn book to singing contemporary Christian music was not the end of the road. Getting the church to leave the hymn book to sing Worldly rock and roll music is where they were headed. Contemporary music was just the road to get them there. And remember the temple of God and the temple of idols, right? Got to transform the church. So we have to do with, we have to do away with, what can wash away my sin? The blood of Jesus. We have to do away with that. So let's sing the new Christian music, but that's not where we're going. We're going to sing rock and roll in church and get by with it. The Ridge Community Church said the non-denominational non service will begin with a video clip of a rocket liftoff amid booming audio. That will segue into heavy electric guitar solo as a live praise band plays stars from the alternative rock group Switchfoot. Now this song, I read the lyrics to this song. This song never mentions God one time. It only talks about finding answers to life in the stars. That's astrology, by the way. Here, this just came out, October 25th. Uh, an Episcopal church uh, uses, uh, oh, let's see here. The, you too, thank you. Not me, okay. You, t you too. This guy Bono, or Bozo, or whoever he is, Bono, he claims to be a, well, he actually he doesn't claim to be a Christian, he claims to be a follower of Jesus. Actually, he's, a, he's an Irish Roman Catholic, is what he is. 
He prays to idols. Now, he's the big superstar in Christian music. And everybody thinks he's a born-again Christian that loves the Lord and all this stuff. And actually, he doesn't. But they're playing his music now in the church to lead the worship service. Pastor Robert Wegner of Granger Community Church began a sermon series called Finding God in Your iPod. He said, join us for the next five weeks as we listen to the heart and consider the truths of today's hottest music. Pastor Rob endorsed a secular rock group named Nickelback. He endorsed them. And he compared the lyrics of their song, Saving Me, to various psalms out of the Bible. Now, you don't know what this song says, but I'm going to show you. According to the pastor's printed notes, he handed out his notes. Everybody in the congregation got a little handout of, of what his sermon notes were going to be. I guess to make him stick to it, I, I don't know. But anyway, distributed among the congregation, he quoted from Nickelback's website concerning the song Saving Me. In other words, the group put comments about the song on their website. So the pastor quoted this. Saving Me addresses a man in prison who wants to be saved. I really like to tell a story that comes off like a movie inside the listener's head. Now notice the, who wants to be saved, dot, dot, dot. Everybody noticed that, right? That means that there's another part of the quotation there from the website that the pastor did not include. You go to the website. By the way, here's a picture of Nickelback. Yeah. Remember? Drunkenness. The website says, Saving Me addresses a man in prison who wants to be saved and a fallen angel who must return to earth to be forgiven of his sins. How art thou fallen from heaven? O oh, Lucifer. And this pastor knew this. And he preached his message and played the music. The temple of God has now become the temple of idols. From Rev Magazine. They say worship services must be upbeat to encourage guests to come back. The worship may be meaningful, but if people are less energized than when they leave, uh, when they leave than when they arrive, what good is that? The message may be full of truth, but if, it, but if listeners are thinking of their to-do list after church, what good is that? Services that lack energy will not be attractive to people who are deciding whether to return. Here are some ways to raise the energy level in worship. Begin by pumping up the volume. The impact of the same song sung by the same talented artist played at the same tempo will vary according to the volume. Volume. Louder music creates more energy. You should also consider the volume of the music played before and after the service. If it's loud, people will begin to talk over the music and the energy level in the room will increase. I thought we were supposed to invite the Holy Spirit in. Amen. Secular music in the church. Pastor Gary Lamb said, We have always used secular music in our services, especially if it had a quote-unquote spiritual message. But lately, we have been using a lot more secular music with no spiritual message, but it goes along with the message. Next week, we are playing, and he listed two secular songs. They both fit and work with the message. We are about the unchurched and have discovered playing secular songs instantly connects with these people. When you start that song, you can instantly see a look of relief that they know what is going on. Just a rock and roll concert's all it is. Rick Warren said, There are some types of people that your church will never reach because they require a completely different style of ministry than you can provide. And who is that? It's the elders. Can I tell you what the New Testament doctrine is? New Testament doctrine, when you drive them out... You ain't got a backbone anymore. Huh? You know why elders? Because they remember the old ways. They remember where the old paths are. And they know how to get to them. They know how to seek them. And that's what God said, isn't it? Seek ye out the old paths. How are you going to find the old paths? Ask the old guys in your church. They remember where they were. You guys drive them old towns you used to hang out in, you grew up in, and you remember where all the old stores were, all the old hangout. Amen? You see, they want these guys driven out. Preaching. 
I like to preach. I love to preach. I don't want to do anything else but preach. God's put a, a fire in my bosom. And I love to preach the Word of God. I was going to, ten years ago, stop preaching the Word of God and start giving positive mental attitude lectionaries about how people could feel happy and look good. I was going to do all that stuff. I was going to study psychology so I could be a counselor behind the pulpit. And that's what's going on in the churches right now. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached among you or unto you, let him be accursed. Second Timothy said, preach the word. Preach what? The word. The Bible. How hard is that? I had a guy, I had a singer at my church, bless his heart. I loved him to death. I loved the spirit he had. We were talking and he said, he said, boy, he said, I don't know if I could be a preacher. I said, why not? He said, I, he said the responsibility of having to come up with three messengers or four messages every single week. He said, I don't know that I could, I said, I don't know that I could do it. I said, I, I'll tell you what I found out. When you let God give you the messages, you don't have to come up with them. That's right. Now, I tell you what, I like to preach. I think it's the easiest thing in the world to do is get up and preach when you've been with God. It is. Oh, here's Joel Osteen. Boy, he's a preacher. You seen his show? Boy, he's got a big wing ding little thing going on, doesn't he? He's the new preacher. You know what? He's a false prophet. He's a heretic. He believes the New Age philosophy in the charismatic movement called Word Faith. He believes that you create things by saying them. He says you have creative power in your mouth. And all you have to do is speak things and they come. He said you're God. You are God. You speak things and these things come out of your mouth and you create them. He's a heretic. Got the biggest church in the state of Texas. Bought out the... The Houston Rockets basketball gymnasium or whatever it was spent 90 million bucks on it to renovate it so they could have church in this thing. Oh yeah, and the seats are full too. Thousands, tens of thousands are going to hear this guy. And you know what? He's a false prophet. You know how I know? He was on Larry King. And Larry King about three times tried to jam him into saying, Larry King asked him, do you believe Muslims are going to heaven? Well, Larry, I don't want to be negative. I want to come and talk about positive. You know how he talks, right? Is that, was that pretty good? Was that pretty good? We want to talk about positive things in our church. And Larry King tried to drive him three times to it, and he wouldn't touch it. That's a false prophet. So, imagine my amazement. He wrote a book called Your Best Life Now. And it's all about this new age positive mental attitude, nonsense, that if you just think better thoughts, everything in your life, and that actually God cannot work in your life unless you think the right thoughts. That's not true, is it? You know what God said about your thoughts? They're vanity. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Bible says. The thoughts, God knows the thoughts of man that they are vanity. God's not waiting around for you to come up with the correct thought. But he said in his book that if you want to propel yourself to greater Christianity, you need to change your thoughts. So imagine, imagine my dismay or shock when a fellow pastor sent me the sermon notes of a free will Baptist pastor in Oklahoma. And I did. he sent me the sermon notes and I'm looking at it and going, boy, that sounds like that New Age stuff. And you know what, I, when I dug it up and researched it, I found that this pastor took this book between pages 108 and pages 119 and wrote down the seven things that he had in those pages and preached them Sunday morning. Number one, he's lazy. I happen to know the guy. Number two, where was that man all week when he should have been in the Word of God? Okay? Okay. Number three, he was preaching heresy in a free will Baptist church. And you know what? They won't touch him. They won't touch him. The new preaching. Pastor Ronnie Floyd, who was nominated for the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, said, putting a talking head in front of kids for an hour doesn't work. 
See, it's all about pragmatism, what works. This is a visual generation. We need to use technology to the max. Now, this is from a guy whose church includes a fire engine baptistry that's designed to shoot confetti out of cannons when a child is baptized. Can you imagine John the Baptist? <laughs> It is funny to an extent. It's sickening. John the Baptist would walk up on this and he'd tell it like it is. He'd look at this pastor and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Naperville Baptist Church. Take a look at the sermons. That, that, they give you all the sermons they're preaching in October and November. Making the cut. How to make the wise choice. Taming the tongue, how to keep your foot out of your mouth. Life in the fast lane, how to reduce stress. How to taper your temper. You've got a friend in me, how to develop relationships. Developing respect, uh, refining your reputation. Where's the blood? Where's the cross? Where's sin? Where's preaching on adultery? Where's preaching on pornography and drunkenness? Where are those things and those messages? They're not being touched anymore. Not being preached anymore. Daybreak Church Hudsville, in Hudsonville, Michigan. Sermon series called A Guide to Domestic Bliss. Willow Creek Community Church. Rick Warren's church. Or actually Bill Hybels church. An elephant in the room. Some blessings and struggles revolve around relationships. Dating, marriage, parenthood. One of those secret sermons is entitled In the Bedroom. Remember what sells? Hang on to you. Put your seatbelts on, guys. We're fixing to get there. Buckhead Church, Atlanta, Georgia. A sermon series called I Marriage. Okay? It's all about relationships. How to have a better marriage life. This sermon series, a conference, sex and the supremacy of Christ. Bay Area Fellowship. A sermon series called Thank God for Sex. Sermons entitled, What Makes Housewives Desperate? The Greatest Sex You'll Ever Have. Whole sermon devoted to that. Here we have um, old Ed, uh, Ed Young. Did a sermon series called The Sexual Revolution. A five-week series. One of them called Stripped. Another one called Heaven on Earth. Another one called Leashed. You see, these are innuendos, aren't they? Do your thing. Messed up. In fact, Ed Young, this is from their website, Ed Young shows us that when we learn to associate it with the right things, sex takes on a new level of meaning and influence in our lives. And by putting sex in the right place, we can actually experience heaven on earth. I'm going to play another clip. This is Ed Young preaching on this series on sex. Herein lies the problem. For far too long, we've kicked the bed out of church and the church out of the bed. During this series, we're going to bring the bed back to church and the church back in bed because, because sex, sex is worship. Is because worship. Because this lady preacher, look at it, October through, uh, September through October, making love last a lifetime, God's plan for sexual intimacy, intimacy, habits of unhealthy marriages, what men wish women knew about men, what women wish, this is disgusting, it's in the church, and remember who's bringing it in, she is, who is she, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of who, harlots. New Spring Community Church. Sermon series called Hitch. The pastor's description. I'm preparing a series for singles this fall entitled Hitch. And I promise there will be a message on sex. Yes. I will speak about sex to singles. Telling them that it is wonderful. But encouraging them to wait. Now encouragement is not the same as a commandment. I've had, to, I've had people tell me, I've never heard a pastor say that sex is wonderful. My response to them is, maybe you've never had a happy pastor. One pastor even described in his message 
where him and his wife have done it in their house. Bring the bed back to church and the church back in bed because, because sex is worship. Sex is worship. This lady preacher, look at it. October through uh, September through October, making love last a lifetime. God's plan for sexual intimacy, intimacy, habits of unhealthy marriages. What men wish women knew about men. What women wish. This is disgusting. It's in the church. And remember who's bringing it in. She is. Who is she? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of who? Harlots. New Spring Community Church. Sermon series called Hitch. The pastor's description. I'm preparing a series for singles this fall entitled Hitch. And I promise there will be a message on sex. Yes. I will speak about sex to singles, telling them that it is wonderful, but encouraging them to wait. Now, encouragement is not the same as a commandment. I've had, to, I've had people tell me, I've never heard a pastor say that sex is wonderful. My response to them is, maybe you've never had a happy pastor. One pastor even described in his message where him and his wife have done it in their house. Granger Community Church, Granger, Indiana, Sermon Series Family Channel. Attempting to learn biblical family lessons from five TV families, including the Osbournes, that's Ozzy Osbourne, the Simpsons, the Cosbys, the Brady Bunch, the Cleavers, the Mayberry Bible Study, Andy Griffith, Pastor Robert Schuler, you know this guy, Crystal Cathedral. He said, I don't think any, anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelical evangelistic enterprise than the unchristian, uncouth strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Classic reform theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered and not man-centered. You know what he's doing? He just said, he said, you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, pastor. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for preaching that man's a sinner and he needs to be saved. That's what he said. Micah chapter 2. God said, Prophesy ye not, say to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. In other words, the people are saying, Don't preach to us. And the pastors are obliging. Micah 2.11, If a man walking in the Spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10. In fact, take your Bible, turn there. I'm going to close with this. God said this, To whom shall I speak and give warning? You know what God's looking for? God's looking for a man that will stand and preach out this book. And I'll tell you something. They're few and far between anymore. A lot of guys claim they're doing it, but they're not. They're not. They're not reading the book, writing sermons. They're writing sermons and using the book to back it up. They're giving psychology lessons. They're giving counseling lessons. They're talking dirty on the stage. They're saying everything in the world but what people really do need to hear. And what people really do need to hear is they are lost and sinners desperately in need of the blood of Jesus Christ to save them or they'll burn in hell. And that's another message you won't hear them preach anymore. Messages on hell, because it's not positive. It might offend in my church of 5,000. It might offend 4,000 people, and I'll lose them to the other church that's not doing it. So God says, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, which means their listening ability is not governed by the Holy Spirit. And they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. When Rick Warren actually tells the pastors that they need to remove the religious icons 
and the religious symbols and the religious sayings out of their service so as not to offend, the word of the Lord is, has become to him a reproach. He's ashamed of the Bible. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. They have no delight in it. Verse 11, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to what? Covetousness. You know what that is? It's lust. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. He's talking about the clergy. They have healed also the herd of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. These guys are going around patting everybody on the back, slicking them up, telling them how good they are, telling them how desperate God is for them, instead of telling them how desperate they need to be for God. They're telling them everything's fine, everything's okay. Go do these things that I tell you to do in this little message series and your life will be great and God will bless you. And oh, by the way, since you came, now you're a Christian. They're saying, peace, peace. And I'm telling you, there is no peace. God is on the other side of this thing and God is at war with them. But they're telling them it's okay. Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, because you can't preach shame anymore. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, sounds like the Lord's coming, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. God is saying, instead of going for a new church, won't you go one that's going the old way? God's begging, God's pleading with them. But you know what they say? We will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations and know O congregation, what is among them? Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba, and the sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. You know what God's saying? I don't care for your worship services much nor your sacrifice is sweet unto me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, listen to this, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and their fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. God says to this wicked church generation, he says, you can t I'm begging with you, I'm pleading with you to come out of this stuff, and you won't listen to me. I've done everything that I can, and now I've had all I'm going to take. I'm going to lay stumbling blocks down in front of you to make you fall. And fall you will. So you know what? They say, Rick Warren says, well, your church is dead. Your church is dead. Why? Because we haven't filled 5,000 people in here. We don't have a million dollars in the bank. We don't have a rock and roll, roll show going up on the stage. And we don't have our women flopping around on the ground showing their panties to everybody. So Rick Warren says, your church is dead. Our church is alive, however. Look at what we're doing. Look at all this stuff. Look at all the blah, blah, blah. Our church is alive. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll just make this real simple. Y'all know about chickens, don't you? Two chickens. And all you can see is from here down. 
pop the head off one of those chickens. And what's that chicken going to do? Boy, he's going to have... Yeah! And they'll say, that chicken's alive. But the truth is, watch this. The truth is, the chicken that's still alive is the chicken that's still standing. Not the one that put on the show. Not the one that fell. The one that's still standing. If anybody tells you your church is dead, it might be if you step away from the Word of God. But you stand with this man, and you stand with the Word of God. God says you're alive. Because you're still standing. My hope is that this church, ten years down the road, when it has gotten worse than what I describe now, this church still stands. What my hope is for those who watch this is that ten years down the road, your church still stands on the old way. God bless you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.